you see the title, we're going to talk about tritium monitoring. And the primary speaker is Warren Sheehan. I'm Bob Bowman. I'm the guy in parenthesis, the little assistant. So this is Warren's story, and uh, I helped him uh, put it together. And so tonight we're going to uh, talk about monitoring tritium or a better mousetrap. And uh, Warren had a long time uh, employee. He had 16 years in health physics and environmental, and then he got corrupted and went to nuclear operations for 17 years. And, and so this it's is on. essentially a, an oil history of, the, the, of, a, of a technique to monitor tritium that was indigenous, developed here by Warren, uh, and was used extensively at Mound for several decades. So uh, we start off with a little cartoon. Uh, I'm assuming everybody knows Homer, and uh, he uh, has a nice bright green yellow uh, piece of radioactivity. And uh, the point is that if this was tritium, he wouldn't need his uh, bubble suit and all the other things. Uh, however, it, tritium is still radioactive and needs to be monitored. And uh, so this is actually a comparison of the re relative hazards of the radioisotopes that were used at Mound. There's two categories. I point out this thing. The most hazardous, and you'll see top of the list, the number one item is plutonium-238. Uh, going down with other actinides, very hazardous are, 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 are radium and plutonium-239 and polonium, also big, big actors in the history of mound. And so if you looked at all the isotopes, those, the main ones, plutonium-238, had a, is the top of the heat, and then actinium, uh, 227, polonium, radium, and here's tritium. You know, these are 150. This is 5.6 milli in the, re, re, so, you know, relatively speaking, uh, tritium not as hazardous as, as these other guys. And, uh, however, there is a distinction. Tritium is HT, a molecular molecule that's biologically inert. It doesn't do much. How, uh, so, but however, uh, the other elements will actually substitute in the body, be retained in particle. Tritium as a gas is, is relatively innocuous. So again, this, this is a, an assessment that is like 27,000 times less uh, hazardous than plutonium-238. But if you look... Yes. I want to back up that slide. Sure. I mentioned why 238 is on there. But it, it, okay. Uranium. Aha. Uh -huh. Uranium. Yeah. Okay, the plutonium, uh, uranium 238, that's with the gaseous diffusion plant. And you'll see they're talking metric tons. This is the equivalent amount of radioactivity in uh, grams, uh, it would take that 10,000 curies. The uh, plutonium 238 batch size was 600 uh, grams. Tritium is very, it has a short half-life and, and is only one gram per 10,000 curie. But compared to uranium-238, uh, this was the operating of the gas diffusion plants that, that were done. And, and so it's much less radioactive than what hazard than, than the other materials. So hopefully I covered the point that, yeah. that Warren... That was prepared for the uh, NIOSH people. Yeah. And, uh, However, there still is an issue with tritium, and that is you form HTO, tritiated water. Now it gets in the biological system. So if you have molecular hydrogen, you, if you happen to breathe, it comes right out. You have tritiated water, it exchanges with the water. So now you bring tritium into your system. And so this, uh, this is a table compared, this is a relatively recent one, uh, comparing the, the relative hazard of organically bound tritium and tritium gas, these are units 10 to minus 11, 10 to minus 15. Tritiated water is 1,000, 10,000 times more potentially hazardous than HT gas. So when you're looking at tritiated water, now it's a big concern. And so if you have uh, tritium converted into water, you really uh, have an issue to deal with. So now what I'm going to do is switch over to Warren and let him talk for a few minutes about this, uh, uh, what he was involved with in the monitoring of 
of water and uh, molecular tritium in, high, in air. Got it up? Let's see, I, this, I'll control the, here, oh, the here's a pointer. the pointer. You can use this pointer. Yeah, that's right. Oh. There you go. Okay, before we go any further, I want to thank Bob profusely because if it worked for him, I wouldn't have these slides. And uh, I wouldn't be here because I wouldn't do it if I had to do it all. Okay, so he was quite a help and I appreciate it. Where are you, Bob? I'm, behind, I'm yeah. hiding behind oh, you. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm in your I'm, I'm I try not to say anything. If, if you have any problem with the slides, I don't like them. Blame me. Don't tell him, tell me. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, this document here contains all the uh, technical information that was used to develop the process, with the exception of one where I started. I'll cover that later on. But uh, anyhow, if I can find this pointer here. Oh, okay, we go. Well, here we go. Okay, I'm going to break down the authors. First of all, I left out one word out of this article here, out of the title. It should see, say differential, but it's implied, HTO and HT. Now, Bob's already called this out. Here is the, there is the problem health-wise, right here. In other words, this, this is about uh, 10,000 times more uh, of a problem to the body than, than HT. So, actually, for environmental, you need to kind of know what you got. And so, okay, now, this is a differentiating. In other words, it separates it out, and it collects the H2 separate from the HT. Now, uh, about the authors, okay, uh, I brought the, H the HTO collection to the game. Charlie Carter, right here, and right over here. There you are, Charlie. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go, Charlie. He, he developed the HT part of it. Mary Lou Curtis, the man of Curie at the Mount Lab, she had developed a, a radioactive gas standard. She had a standard there that uh, Charlie and I both benefited from to validate our, our process. So we owe a lot. Not only that, she brought, us a, brought me a bad a horrible procedure, which Bob will be going through. And I say horrible because I didn't like it, so uh, and that, you won't understand that. But Mary Lou had a way of doing things, and you bring her any problem, she would beat it. She would master it if she had to take a sledgehammer to it. Isn't that right, Joe? That's right. right. She would solve the problem. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm ready to go. Okay. Generally speaking, very unimpressive. Uh, very reliable, effective. Now, when I say very impressive, if I tell you you can collect, you have a tritium air sampler in your home, if you have an aquarium, and if you're bubbling air through your water to keep the fish alive, you are collecting tritium if it's in the air. It's how technical it is. So, if you have an aquarium in your basement or wherever, you have a collector of tritium oxide, not gas, tritium oxide. That's water, okay? Uh, most of this talk is going to be about applications. The process is so very simple, not much to talk about. Environmental monitoring, before we went to the bubbler, we actually had nothing. Well, we did. We had an instrument that was used called the T290. I've never found out what the detection limit was for the T290, but it's very insensitive, very insensitive. And uh, my boss, Herb Meyer, once said, my God, if we ever see anything out there with this thing, we're really in trouble. So that told me it's not very good. But it was a military, an ion chamber, an ion chamber instrument, and, uh, but the sensitivity just wasn't all that good. Leak checking, that's the procedure that uh, we'll expound on a little bit that Mary Lou had for uh, the weapons components that came back in once for surveillance. And uh, it was quite a procedure. Okay, the effluent of the stack gases, that was long overdue. And uh, to, to, def 
differentiate what we have. There were several problems there, so this solved a major problem there, a major problem. And Kyle Production, that was a classified production. Others were there taking the process, setting it up in a lab. I trained the lab technician uh, that they hired for the uh, assurance, quality assurance. So actually two of the, two of the four are uh, production type things. In other words, the uh, check, leak check and Kyle and the environmental and the, and the uh, uh, stack gas, that's both uh, somewhat uh, ecology or I'll call it subculture. I call them people in health physical subculture. People in the main line or the, the real world. But So we serve both purposes. Ready? Yep, ready. Okay, this is more or less uh, the road down the line. I go clear back to 58. Uh, because I met a gentleman in the X-10. I had been sent to, to Oak Ridge in 58 to a special health physics school, and one of the uh, guys in the class is named Lou Henley. He was supervisor of the bioassay group at X-10, and by that virtue of that, he and I were, had a lot in common since I had sort of counterpart here. Well, in 67, I was trying to get a hold of Lou, to find out some chemistry I knew he was familiar with, and uh, found out he was always off taking his air samples for trillium. So when I finally caught up with him, I said, Lou, you know, being a what chemistry guy, what are you doing taking trillium air samples? And he told me what he was doing. Well, turns out they had a, an accidental release of trillium, and apparently they didn't have much interest in it. It's in 4500 area, which is a research area. Anyhow, he was dragging air through calcium chloride and the desiccant, it's a desiccant, and it'd take the moisture, he'd dissolve it up to volume and count it, like the cellulation counter. So, hey, that kind of sparked my interest, and uh, other than that, I had no involvement with the trillium program at all, although my shop ran the urine samples, so other than the process of doing that, which was like the cellulation counter, I had really zero input on uh, the uh, trillium. Okay, well, I, I to evaluate it, I selected the level four, and I'll get into that. Before I got out of level four, I switched it to, to water, and then in 67, I initiated, and also in 67, the environmental monitoring based on the buffer. And then in 73, when I got over to E107, I, I changed uh, from, from uh, PSDC or environmental control to nuclear at 72. And when I got over there, then I ran into Charlie uh, and his issue, and uh, Mary Lou and her issue, and that problem was changed. And then I finally adopted the bubbler for the uh, for leak check, and then uh, following that on the stacks. So that sort of takes us through the whole thing. Okay, level four. I bet most of you didn't know they had trillium in t dose way back in 67. Well, there was. Level four is uh, one of the cubby holes. As you went down, in other words, uh, the, uh, each tower, now this is an NGOT building. There's, here's the penthouse where you come in, fifth level, fourth level, and so on. Well, Los Alamos had sent mound a bunch of tritium garbage, and uh, we were going to recover the tritium. Well, it's set up there for, I don't know, one years, I reckon. It was up there a long time. There had been a canade hooked up to it, and the remote code of it was in the hallway of the cold side of the tea building. Well, anyhow, I set up shop in that in the fourth level, and I ran, uh, a, I tried to do the process, and gosh dang, it worked. Well, I ran enough, I ran enough to know that the source was very consistent, and naturally it would be. There was nothing else going on in this room. This, the room was probably 10 by 15, just a big office or a medium size office. And it had this tubs of um, crap that came from Los Alamos. What was in it? I don't know. But anyhow, it's off gassing at a constant rate, and it's been there for a long time. There's nobody moving around the room, so it was a very consistent source. Well, my repeated runs seemed to be very, very reproducible. 
And I don't know if it's divine providence or what. I decided that I'm going to try to see if this will, the bubble will take it out. And lo and behold, it did. Well, then I compared the bubbler with the calcium chloride, and I got comparable results. Now, what I don't remember is whether or not I daisy chained to see whether or not the bubbler was getting it all. I don't recall that. But later on, of course, I did. But at the end, when I came out of this operation here, I knew an awful lot. Okay, next slide, Bob. Okay. And this was just a matter of a couple of weeks' time. I found out that 100% of the tritium or oxide, H2O, was collected with the water bubbler. I also found out that the losses were, in, were linear with the loss of water by evaporation. In other words, the losses were equal to evaporation from the bubbler. So I lost 10% bubbler of water by corrected by 10%. And that compared to the calcium chloride. Now, as far as the HT, I don't know a thing about that. I didn't really care less. It's kind of like old Clark Eagle. I didn't give a damn, you know, about the HT. But whether it contributed to the H of TO, I had no idea. This is a statement by Orville Wright. I thought fit this. Isn't it astonishing that these secrets have been preserved for so many years just so we could discover them? Well, I didn't know if this was a secret, but nobody else was doing it, as far as I know. They may have been, but it wasn't in the literature, although I'd have to look. But later on, you'll know why I'm being saying that. There was a researcher up at uh, Chalk River in Canada by the name of R.V. Osborne. He summarized the performance of the bubbler by saying, the most important variable determining the overall collection efficiency of HTO in the bubble area is the intrinsic value of the water law at the water loss in the affluent area. Stated another way, the overall performance of the bubbler is primarily dependent on its retention capability since collection is essentially 100% at all times for HTO entering the system. Pretty good. Now, to resolve the evaporation problem, I started using ethylene glycol instead of water, and it worked. That's why we used ethylene glycol. Now, a little ahead of the story, I had no reason to have a long sampling period for the environmental samples because it was a short-term sample. But when I got over to E107, then I had more reason to lengthen the time. That's when I went to drop glycol. Okay, here's the first application. I'll make a big point to say that, okay, first it was adopted the same year they kind of run across this, 67. And we're at our point ago, here we go. Okay, I, I make a big point of the, the list of equipment. Okay, I already had a liquid scintillation counter, didn't have to buy that. We already had a vehicle, a driver, didn't have to get that. So what I ended up having to have an air pump, that, that uh, circular thing was, I call it the hat box. I had the carpenter shop make a what I call just a hat box, and it had a posi eight positions for plastic bottles. And we had eight stops, and each stop they would run a 10 or 15 minute sample, I don't remember which. But all I have invested in is eight pint bottles, and I went to Brave, Sol Brave Solution instead of water. Brave Solution was a liquid solution counting solution, and I got better sensitivity because I could count all of it. In other words, I could just take a portion of that. It was very volatile, so it was not good for anything but a very short, simple sampling period. So, very little than anything invested in it. I will point out an interesting story about this thing. I, in looking over the data from the routes, there was one site that kept coming up showing more than any place else, and I got curious about it. And so I went to the route sheets to see where it was. Well, it turned out to be in almost my backyard. It was over around 48 and 73. And Andy Anderson, which most of you know, had written the route sheets, and they suggested the drive where he parked that beer joint parking lot. Well, I figured it out. The guys were clean. I didn't have to shut shut off on the, on the uh, air pump, so I was getting a long sample. So they were going in there and have a couple of beers. But all the other 
the other thing is, since this is a volatile solution, and uh, it's gonna, and I had always noise, I was probably overcorrecting the sample. In other words, we'll say if there was 50% evaporated because they still didn't stay in there an hour, well then any noise was doubled. So they kind of explained it, but and it was real, 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 real safety line up down the parking beer joint parking lot. Okay. All right, the same year, 67, uh, a fellow worked for me named Bob Robinson. He said, gee, we ought to submit that to the Hill of Physics uh, Mid-Year Symposium. Well, we did. And the title, A Low-Cost Method to Measure Trade in the Environment. Well, the paper was rejected. Uh, one of the guys, now Patterson says, uh, as you can see, I got mixed reviews. One guy gave thumbs up, one guy gave thumbs down because he said it wasn't that expensive if you had to have a liquid simulation car. <laughs> well, so help me, that guy is sort of like hiring a painter that can't afford a paintbrush, you know? If you're handling tritium, you better have a liquid simulation car. That's all there is to it, period. Uh, he, Patterson, who was the superintendent of health physics at Savannah River from Starbuck, until he retired in 77, his comment was, a novel idea, if indeed it does work. I guess I could have my health physics people at this RP try. Which says, I guess if it works for us, it's all right. If it works for you, suspect. I don't know. But really, I think what, is, what it really amounted to is, it was embarrassing, maybe, to Savannah River to know that this was under their nose and they never were aware of it. They weren't using it. They were not. They were using silica gel. Silica gel is a dust can take the moisture out of the air, then you have to bake it off the counter. A little bit. That's what they're, Doug will tell you. People are still using that, but I think it was an embarrassment to them for that reason. This is a liquid ventilation counter. The only reason I'm showing it is that the pig sets in a deep freeze. The pig. There's photo tubes in the bottom that look at each other, and the, the, the early photo tubes had an electronic noise, so they put them in a deep freeze so as to uh, the electronic uh, noise is cut down. So, and it, they have it over 200 counts, or 200 bottles, and uh, the bottles are very, where are they? Wait, wait, wait. Here, I, I have your bottle, there your bottle. You can put 200 of these in there, let them count, recount, whatever. So, anyhow, that's, that's a liquid ventilation counter. <coughs> They're not cheap, that's for sure, but you, you don't go, you don't handle trading without it, I can tell you that. Okay, Bob. Okay. Okay, all okay. right. Well, you one other thing here, and then I'm going to turn it back to Bob. 67 to 72, I was still in in uh, environmental control. I had no other need for the process, and I didn't go any further with it until I got over to E-107. So there, that's why there was a dearth of, of anything going on. However, there was some, some noise being made by Ralph Newbert, who was raising all kinds of hell with the nuclear people because they didn't know the species he was putting up the stack. So people like Charlie here and other people were working on a oxidation method. Okay, Bob. Okay. So that you rest for a minute. And I'll start telling you a little more of the story and get back over here so you can hear me. As Warren was saying, uh, there was an issue and he got transferred and what he did was, I said, well, there's a way perhaps we can get all that information. And uh, so in 1973, they combined them. We'll have some details in a minute. And again, as, as Warren was saying earlier, ethylene glycol was a better uh, solution because it didn't evaporate to capture the tritium and do the measurement. So in 73, uh, they also validated, and then they adapted the next year of the procedure. And if I go to the next slide. Uh, so, so this is, in essence, the combination, two parts. The upper one, this was, the continuous sampling with a uh, palladium catalyst uh, blowing air through, sweeping through, that would convert the HT to HTO. 
and then that would go to a water trap and then get probed. And that's what Mary Lou and what Charlie was working on. This was the bubbler system that uh, Warren had. And so what he did is put this part in there so they could blow first the air swept through the HTO bubbler so it would catch the HTO. Then the gas, which HT, which was not trapped, would go through here, be oxidized, converted in, into water, and then cap captured in these. And then each of these would be separately measured. So these are the components. So this is the bubbler. You would have gas come in, the ethylene glycol, bubble through, and it would go out. It get captured here. This is the, the catalyst. would be in here with the heater. Oh, what am I doing? Ah, let's see. Go back. Yeah, there we are. And so, uh, and then this is again with, with the components that were in there. You need to have a pump to flow it through. And then these will be separately analyzed. Now, as they were saying for leak detection, what they were used for is they would have cans. These are, look like just disposable containers. Components come in, tritiate components, weapons components, reservoirs, and they'd be leak checked. You put them in there for a period of time. Uh, Warren said a few days, I don't know what their schedule was. But these were converted cans. They would, they would put a coating inside to stop the water from uh, reacting with the metal surfaces and then collect the gas that would come through the bubbler and analyze them. So this is a proportional counter. It would come in, they would do the, the, the sample detection down through here. This is from their procedure about how they would catch the gas and detect it, well, again, with a proportional counter to actually monitor that. And so what they did, is, these are an example. One was whether you used a carrier gas. They would use eight pure H2 in argon, sweep it through. And so this was the result. These are separate runs and they would add H2 and then they would recover that and then they would compare the numbers. And what they would find is they were getting, you know, like 96 percent uh, recovery with a standard deviation. This is with the carrier gas. They also repeated the experiment with just flowing the air through without that. And again, they got 99 percent with, with a closer standard. So part of that experiment was you didn't need to have a carrier gas in order to sample the atmosphere. And, and and, and monitor it, monitor it. And so they could do sampling relative time, several hours with, with 5 cc uh, or 10 cc. And again, we're getting pretty much full recovery, accuracy all the time. So they can monitor uh, the uh, uh, systems of the leaking. So you could use dry air for flushing, retain the tritium, and get excellent period of time with no water we had to be added. You didn't have to do extra steps. So it made it much more convenient with the bubbler. So again, this is a kind of a reiteration of that with the, with, with the system. And we're going to switch back to Warren. But this is a picture of Warren about 45 years ago when he was a, just a wee bit younger. But hard at work, as you'll see. Hands on. Okay. Hands on guy, he said. Hands on guy. And, uh, so uh, I'm going back to let Warren because he can only rest so long, you know. I mean, yeah. And this is where we're going to talk about the next application of of the mon of the bubblers. Okay. There you go. Okay. There you go. <clears throat> I'm going to be up here in this a while, but like you, you've you already suffered through the worst, I think. <laughs> uh, okay. This is kind of where we're going from here. '74. Uh, after getting the leak check thing going and all that, I made a trip over to Valley's office and I said, Valley, I think we need to put this on the stacks. And I was prepared to try to defend the process, but all Dick asked me was, how much do you think it would cost? I gave him a figure. He said, do it. Well, I think Dick knew a lot more. Dick Valley, if you knew him, played his cards very close to his chest. He probably knew more about the process than what I thought he knew. But anyhow, he bought it. And so we went ahead, did the, uh, uh, went ahead and put them on the stacks. Now I want to take you back to uh, ionization chamber, how we were monitoring the stacks before. Go back? No, no, back. I'm sorry. Yep, Bob, go forward. OK. These are uh, tracings from the canaise. 
And the Canadian Chamber is how we monitor not only rooms, but also the stacks. And in this one here is two things being shown. The peaks you see, you'll see there were 10 carry releases that uh, Ben Ryan, Amber, and Charlie here did at various places in the buildings to see the response. And uh, so one of them is the SW stack, and one's the R building. Now, the reason I'm putting these side by side is the R building stack had a background problem. Down at the bottom there, you'll see the radon. Radon 226, 224, 223. We had all three because the parent material was from irradiated 226 out of the old cave. In other words, this was a 1950 one, two, three program, but the residue was still in the ducts and so forth, and then the cave itself, and they played the havoc with the background of the uh, kinetic. Now, one alpha particle will produce a thousand times what one beta particle will. So uh, that ionization chamber responds to ion pairs. So it responds a lot more to alpha in the way of the ion pairs that are produced. So you get a lot of kick out of a little bit of radon. So there was an attempt to try to find out and prove was it short. You can see that the difference between this W and our building is about one order of magnitude. Uh, the Canadian was a six decade, uh, six orders of magnitude. It went from about two microcuries per cubic meter to uh, two curies. Uh, well, anyhow, by Cutting off of the supply to the Kine, you can see that dip, and that dip is probably 90 seconds or less. And then you can flatten it off, and then you raise it back up. So now, how much we were claiming to be tritium that wasn't tritium, I don't know, over the years, because up until this time, <clears throat> up until we time got the bubblers, health physics people had to take all those peaks and kind of integrate them by eyeball and then the baseline, figuring out what the baseline was and to get the total airflow. In other words, the, these ionization chambers did not totalize. And that's one thing the bubbler did do, was totalize. So anyhow, there was a lot of, a lot of work to get the figures on what our airflow was, nor did we know what was gas or what was oxide. The ionization chamber doesn't know the difference. It just sees ions. Okay, you're right. There's a mistake on this slide. Believe it or not, I made it up years ago, but I just caught it this morning. There's the five I had. I was counting up five stacks. Well, I had one on the I building. There's not one on the I building. It, it was never one there. But the uh, the one that's missing is the SW stack, which is in this picture. In other words, SW. This is a very early picture, and so the SW stack stood right back of the uh, breezeway there. But anyhow, I got five stacks in there even though one don't exist. But anyhow, that, that, that's the areas that we, we put the monitors on right away in uh, 75. Bob, I'm going to let you take this one. Okay, Warren. There, there was a metal stack. Yes, that's the SW stack. The, the metal stack. Between, between uh, Between B building and uh, R building. Right there at the breezeway. You can see it off the breezeway. That was the SW stack. And it only went about 800 or 800, about 80 or 90 feet in the air, I think. Well, it was a metal stack. It was yeah. a metal stack. It, it was, was different. Great. It was a and I had, I had an office in R151, and yeah. I would hear that thing creaking. Yeah. And I went out and looked at it, and the top was moving yeah. six or eight yeah. feet. Another name for that. NCDPS stack? Yeah, it could have been. NCPDF, yeah. yeah, could have been that, yeah. It was about to come down until engineering went out and put fins on it. Yeah, yeah that, that's the stack that's missing in that picture, yeah. I don't see it there, right? It is, it is not. So, so Dick, we got a challenge. Find the photograph with all the stacks in there. So we can update it. Find the one, find the photograph where we have all the stacks. Well, uh, I, I can, I mean. I, I know. But well, we didn't. We didn't find it in this week. I mean, you didn't ask me. Somewhere. That's true. Warren didn't tell me till this morning. <laughs> and I said, "Okay, we're 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 going with what we have." You know. Right. I don't have a picture of him 
sitting at the table either. I don't know where that came from. Yeah, I think it was off his own photograph. He's not. So we, we have to share with you. Yeah. Okay. So as, as Warren handed off to me again because you know Warren they they monitor tritium. They didn't do tritium like some of us did. So, but you know there was a tremendous effort, and there are people in the in the room that worked on it to to improve the containment of tritium. Uh, and it's you know in the, and, and this is a plot of, of data collected of pointing out two things. This is the tritium inventory in, in, in the solid red line, starting in 1960, going up to the end of the, pretty much the end of the program in 1990. And so you see there, there was, uh, now these are relative units. My understanding is absolute units of tritium that are processed in mounts were classified, may still be classified. I, but th this chart's made with a relative unit. Oh, back too far. There we go. I want to press this button. This other chart, or the other graph, this is the tritium released in Curie's. Um, uh, and this is actually uh, thousands of Curie's. It's in units of, of, and so this is, and there's 10,000 Curie's per gram. So this is the amount of tritium, which is a fair amount of tritium. Again, this was before implementation. And you can see we're sitting here, and that by the 1970s, when they were setting up all the things to control it, they were handling. Darn it! I won't keep the back on. There we are. The little button that show the light just above the forward backward. For an old guy with fat fingers, it doesn't work well. Uh, that the, the level was even higher than they ever. You know, twice as high. No, all of, almost all the treaty was being captured. However, there is a little dot here. That's where an accident happened in 1989. They had one of the reservoirs that stored tritium. Laser punched a hole in it. All that tritium, several grams, went up the stack. And of course it was picked up. Uh, but overall, in reality, you know, accidents happen. But uh, so, so that's the consequence of being able to monitor. Well, the monitoring was now done from the 70s on with the, the bubbler system that Warren had. So now we're going back to Warren for the details, because obviously he did the work. I can only make up stories about what he did. So. Am I on? Okay, I'm on. Yeah, you're on. Okay, I'm going to back up to that last slide where it shows uh, the reservoir being dumped up the stack. Sometime after that, I ran into the group leader of the outfit and I asked him, how did the bubbler do? He said, I'll tell you how well it did. He said, the investigating committee used the value of the bumper over the counter value. And told him it was pretty good. So, no, no ion chamber instrument would have told you because it was a swamp dip. It swamped it. So, it, in other words, it, but then I'm sure they had a calorimetry value of what went into that bottle, and all they had to do is decay. They knew what should come out. And anyhow, you just said they used the bumper value for the, for the stated value in the uh, report. Okay, configuration. Well, the original the thing is the gas meter here. That was the most the biggest part of the thing I had to buy. This is a brick board. In other words, water and air come in here, went through the gas, a totalizing meter. Got, got the oxide here. We changed the A bubbler daily. The B and C were changed weekly and pooled. So each day, each day you see run the A sample, and that had 90 plus percent of it. But to, to get the total for the month or whatever, these these were pooled here. The same is true once it went through the once it went through the catalyst. B was changed daily. So A and D were changed daily. Uh, B, C. E and F were changed maybe weekly and pooled. So there wasn't a whole lot of work in it, it's just to, just to get the total. And about 90% or better would be in A and D. They modified or changed the, the strategic uh, location of check valves. There was a problem with the differential between the stack and these boulders that they want the back flow. And I, more or less it ran the thing for a few months before I ever turned it loose to anybody else. I found out there's a certain way you could do it, but that's not the kind of thing you want to turn over just to whoever's changing them. So anyhow, we changed the pump, and the pump 
location, and, and this one here, there's my bump right here. Anyhow, the old system, and the pump is pulling it through, and here I think we're, we're pushing it through. Pump here, yeah, it's pushing it through. Anyhow, we just reversed it. That, that helped out. Also, the furnace temperature control indicator was put on to the system so it knew the furnace was working. So, very little difference, but it's resolved a lot of the operational problems. All right, Bob. Okay, now we've got the burner. And in between the first and second uh, issue there, Ben Ronhammer got involved. He worked in Trillium Instrument Group down in T-Building. And he uh, started to, to commercialize it on site. In other words, by the time uh, we come through the second generation, my, this, this unit here was uh, packaged up for commercial application, if you will. So other than that, uh, performance-wise, is all this the same. All right, Bob. Okay, uh, this is probably a slide that uh, I don't know whether we need this one or not. Well, okay, I'll run through it. Gold Ostland was a, was a researcher at the University of Miami, Florida. He had a contract with the AEC too for the, for the exact purpose, specific purpose, of developing a high-sensitive tritium monitor. Well, anyhow, we, I'll, I'll get, cover him a little bit later. Uh, Trudy Butler Lassel, there's a guy came through our shop. He saw the hat box sitting on a lab bench. He asked my guys what it was. They told him. He goes home to Los Alamos and writes a paper on Butler technology, okay? So, but he picked it up at now. Okay, Johnson Instrument, that's something that, uh, what, Kirshner led a contract with the Johnson Instrument Company to uh, build a, an instrument that was very supposed to be, well, it was all right, it just uh, didn't do a whole lot as far as that's concerned. Okay, now let's go to the next one. Uh, uh, right. Okay, back to people. Who had not have talked to him more about him already right now? Dr. Harley. Uh, Jack Stevens, who was sort of over, our overseer from the AEC, invited John and to come in and review our environmental process. Now, I'd known John for a number of years. He was director of the Health and Safety Lab. Health and Safety Lab was a, was a unit of the Atomic Energy Commission. They were civil service people. Uh, in the Manhattan years, they had been set up to develop bioassay procedures for the contractors. That was their mission in life. Now, when that kind of went, run its course, they became the global global monitoring for air, soil, and water, mainly air. Anyhow, they then more or less became the experts in global monitoring. Uh, John, like for instance, when he came in, he explained that when the nine, the SNAP 9A, which is one of our heat sources, burned up coming back in, that the global content or the ratio of 238 to 239 went from 0 0.04 to 0 0.1, just from that, from that uh, heat source that uh, happened 9A. But anyhow, John was a very nice fellow, very competent fellow. Uh, that lab got changed, knocked out of uh, DOE after 9-11. It's now, well, first of all, it changed its name EML. EML. And then uh, from EML it, it became a uh, lab for uh, Homeland, it's part of Homeland Security now. It's, it's in Homeland Security. But anyhow, John, he had mentioned to us, go to Austin, had an instrument. He was going to have, he wanted to know if we'd have to come up here. Well, Newbert, when he got wind of it, he said, I don't I know. But John had sent me a note saying that they had administrative problems. Well, I think the administrative problems, as Newbert said, hell no, you're not coming in here. Because Newbert was very, very uh, paranoid about our position here. And he didn't want, plus, he had a chip on shoulder with Newbert with the AEC in the first place. But, uh, anyhow, Oslin, he was planning to come. He actually sent me a cylinder of tritium free hydrogen gas. He sent it to my home. He didn't want to send it to the lab. And uh, 
Then anyhow, after keeping it a year, why he asked for it back, and I sent it back to lecture ball. Anyhow. Osborne is a, was a researcher in Chalk River. He is a guy that did the nth degree on studying the mother. Valentine's a guy that walked away with the idea from Mount, but didn't give us any credit for it. The other guy's got a patent that I already talked about, Pat, or Patterson, so okay, Bob. Okay, I'm going to turn back to Bob now. You get more arrest. And so, so this, this is sort of what became you know, the, 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 the status in 73 of the, of, of the combined differential sampling of, of, of tritium oxide, uh, HTO, and, and tritium gas. So this is the configuration. You, you see that the bubblers here on one side, we've got the water, and the other side, th this is double station, right? So get yeah, two stations. Two right. stations, so you can sample. Yeah. This, this is the Austin this is the, this is the Austin instrument, which Story and Head was always trying to show work up to date. Yeah. So they said, okay, we'll just have date build this thing for us. So it's Austin's set up. Configure itself. Yeah. And so what it had, it, it collected, here where you had the silica gel, instead of using the, the uh, ethylene glycol, they were going to put silica gel in and, and do all that with the instrument. So, so this is uh, actual. Uh, That's the takeoff. Yeah, the takeoff, where it actually did all, put all together where you can see the components. We had to bake off to get the, the water off in order to analyze it. Now, so that's that device that, that Warren talked about. This is uh, the schematic that was published in that Los Alamos report, which uh, had all the little, but it had the bubblers and all the other filters and dry right and all the other things. Uh, they built a, a demo and they ran it and they said, oh, we, we got this, this, this great tool. But as far as I know, it never got used anywhere else. And out of the Princeton uh, laboratory in 1990, they applied for, or in 1989, they got a patent on using bubblers to monitor tritium. Uh, yeah, well, they were still using a dust bit, Bob. They were still using carrier gas, even. Yeah, they were using carrier gas. So, uh, and there's no mention at all on the on the on the mound reports there, but uh, they they had a patent which uh, was the uh, uh, result of that. So there's that, that list of characters that Warren talked about. Now this is Warren again with that Johnson Lab instrument that that, that Carl had built and, and 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 delivered. And here's Warren studying it, trying to figure out I think how it worked or whether it did work. Yeah, turning the dials. Turning the dials. And uh, so uh, those are those instruments. Now Warren's had a few minutes to rest and we're going to transfer back to him and go try to highlights and then wrap up this, this presentation with Warren finishing. So, uh, back to Warren. Well, there is, there's, maybe I wasn't long enough for us. There isn't much to say here. If you can't see the difference in cost, you don't have very much account for figures. <laughs> okay. So the, 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 the dolled up system, something like Doug's building now, is like 10,000. That hospital now, I'm sure, cost 150000 Carl Kirshner told me himself that the Johnson uh, was 100000 and it wouldn't do what the mother will do. But the uh, Johnson incident was real time. This was not real time. But then again, the purpose, you know, we didn't need a real time. We needed a totalizer and one that would distinguish between HT and HTO. So it filled the purpose better than the Johnson. So, so I moved you up ahead, one. Okay, it's fine. Okay, okay. Now, it looks like from a red worker and then going down to ion chamber is what, a factor of a 110 there? And they go from the red, the red worker means the level in which people can work at. And the level in which the mother would see, could see, is a, what, uh, 10 to the fifth? 10 to the fifth less. Right. So, 10, here, this is another that showing them what it can be used for, the time, the sampling time, and what the uh, LDL is. So uh, that's just, just an idea, or not an idea, it's just a little bit of a, 
I have at least on what the sensitivity of it is versus various time samples. Okay, this is some of Doug's products here, which he'll talk about next month. And uh, these things he's sending all over the country. In fact, Savannah River, or Savannah River he bought something later or not. So, uh, uh, if indeed it does work, Doug. Okay. All right. Here's a, there's a, there's a final version of the, all of the samplers. So, uh, anyhow, it does work. So. Okay. I, the three people I'd like to mention here, Herb Meyer, who I worked for for about 15 years or thereabouts. Very competent fellow. Very nice fellow. I don't know anybody that was mistreated by his management any more than he was. They kept putting corporate numbskulls over him that he had to crane. Uh, I think the problem was they didn't want anybody knowledgeable near the top to uh, wag the tail wag the dog. But Herb had to put up a lot of incompetent bosses. And uh, I think Keith would, Keith would endorse that. Uh, Mary Lou Curtis, wasn't anybody better than her business than her. As I say, she would take a sledgehammer to it if she had to, but she was very competent. And I didn't have to prove anything to her, she just saw the results. And she was ready to ditch that process that she had that more or less inherited. When it comes to stack monitoring, uh, well, he, he sort of had a laser vision, could see through the fog. And uh, as I say, the only thing he asked me, he says, what will it cost? I told him, and uh, I think we got it done for much less than the 10000 I told him I thought. 